Um, Hayden, just to check with you, are we okay to start now? Are you all ready to go? All right, no worries. This is Mark, VK5QI. Um, I've got to make sure to identify on the repeater, um, given I have to do that legally. I'm going to mute everyone on the stream now, on Zoom, sorry. Uh, so here we go. Um, right. So again, thanks very much to the Elizabeth, Am Elizabeth Amateur Radio Club for allowing me to do this presentation. And thanks, Paul, as well, uh, for letting me kind of jump in and give this presentation. Um, uh, this is a presentation, it's an amalgam of some presentations that I've given previously at Linux Conference and at the AREG Club, and also that I was going to be giving at other radio clubs as well. Um, so EARC's the first. Um, you're welcome. So this talk is all about radio songs uh, and how we uh, can track them and reuse them. There's a number of different titles that I've used for this talk in the past, uh, one of which is, uh, you know, tracking radio songs for fun and no profit. Uh, um, and the other one is STM32 development boards literally falling from the sky, um, which is exactly what they are. If I make sure I'm focused on the right window, I can actually change slides. Here we go. So in this talk, um, I'll cover you know what a radio sound is, uh, how they work, why we bother chasing them. Uh, I'll give some detail on a couple of different radio song types, and in particular, the Vaisala RS41, which is what's most commonly flown here in Australia and around the world, in fact. And then I'll talk about the radio song decoding software, which I've developed, and then how you can go in and track and recover these radio songs for yourself. So radio songs 101, what is a radio sound? Well, it's a scientific device uh, launched underneath the weather balloon uh, used to take measurements of the upper atmosphere, um, the measurements of the stratosphere, I should say. And generally, it's some kind of sensors and a radio transmitter of some sort to get to get telemetry back to the ground. Uh, most commonly, you'll find the radio sounds have temperature and humidity sensors. Uh, some of them have pressure sensors. Uh, they almost always have some kind of way of, of measuring wind speed and direction. Uh, which nowadays is via GPS, but back in the day it was via radar tracking. Uh, sometimes you find find they have ozone sensors on board as well, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There's one sitting down beside me. Um, and in most parts of the world, uh, they transmit a radio signal somewhere between 400 and 406 megahertz. Uh, it's almost the, the case all around the world, except for the United States, who have to do things differently as usual and many of their radio songs transmit on L, on L band, so 1.68 gigahertz. And that's the timeout timer. Here we go, dk 5 qi um, Though the US is transitioning back to uh, 400 megahertz as well for commonality in hardware. At the moment, there are 700 radio song launch sites which report to the World Meteorological Organization. There are more that don't report to that organization, uh, but it's somewhere in the vicinity of 700 to 1,000 launch sites um, that are launching uh, daily. In, in Australia, uh, of course, we have, the, have the Bureau of Meteorology and the, and the Atmospheric Sounding Program. Uh, they launch from various sites around Australia uh, in major cities, so capital, state capitals. They usually launch in twice per day, not always, but mostly. And there are also many launch sites in regional areas, which may not be launching every day. Normally, it's a couple of days a week. Uh, and there's also a combination of uh, manned, so mostly manual, someone presses a button and the radio sound launches, um, and, or they go outside and release it, as you can see in the top picture in that slide. Um, and there's also automatic sites as well. I like the one in the bottom of that slide, which is a Vaisala Autoson station. That particular one is in uh, Mount Gambia, the Mount Gambia airport. Around Australia, uh, they launch two types of radio songs, the Vaisala RS-92, which is now obsolete, uh, being phased out and the Vasala RS-41, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, so here's the launch sites around Australia. Um, probably anyone watching will probably have a launch site within a couple of hours drive of them. Uh, as they're all over the country, uh, some very far inland and obviously a lot around the coast. And yeah, there's 40 launch sites uh, within Australia and New Zealand. So a typical radio sun flight uh, will launch usually. Um, so the, the launches are targeted around the times of 0, 6, uh, 12, and 18 Zulu. The idea is, is that global weather models um, work around these 
around these particular times. And the radio sonde launches a time to capture data throughout that particular time. So to capture data for zero Zulu, they launched 45 minutes before at 23.15 Zulu. Uh, for, for capturing data for 12 Zulu, they'll launch at 11.15. Uh, it takes roughly one and a half hours for the sonde to ascend uh, to about you know, 27 kilometers. It really depends upon the launch site. Uh, they ascend at about five meters per second. And this value is particularly critical because the sensors are usually calibrated for a certain wind speed or certain airspeed past them. Then the balloon bursts and then the sonde will land usually about half an hour, half an hour later, depending upon um, what's above the sonde. Uh, so something I didn't quite cover before, um, you know, we're using latex balloons. In the picture before, you didn't, you didn't see a parachute. Um, in that particular picture, the parachute is actually within the um, balloon uh, up here. Um, other cases, there may be a separate parachute. In case of launches in Adelaide, they're actually using a radar reflector as a pseudo parachute. The reason they're using those is because they have a huge amount of them in stock and they just want to get rid of them. Uh, so anyway, the, the radio sonde, the balloon will burst, the radio sonde will descend, it will land. And in the case of the, uh, the Visala RS-41s, they'll keep on transmitting for about another six hours. Uh, this is not a battery life limitation, it's actually a timer. So as soon as the balloon bursts, uh, the a timer starts up and eight and a half hours later, the balloon, the radio sonde turns off. So why would we bother uh, chasing these devices? Well, of all of those 700 uh, radio sonde, you know, or more launches launched per day, uh, precisely none of them are recovered by the launching organization. Uh, so they're littered, they just become litter, littering the countryside, littering the world. Uh, so we can help the Bureau of Meteorology a bit, a bit and clean up their mess for them. Uh, it's also really good practice if you want to go and do your own higher tube, higher tube balloon launch, or if you want to go chase someone else's, pretty much exactly the same thing, just a bit of a different telemetry source. Um, yep, there we go. Uh, it's a good way of testing out chase car systems to see whether you can chase a balloon flight. And of course, the payloads in the case of Australia are very, very reusable. Um, you can do all sorts of things with them. And finally, you can make really good Christmas decorations out of them. Uh, so uh, here's some, a nice Christmas tree um, with some radio songs hanging off of it. And on the right hand side, there is Paul BK5NE's uh, radar reflector Christmas ornament. I really love what you've done there, Paul. That's brilliant. So there are many different types of radio songs used worldwide, heaps of different models. Um, this pie chart kind of shows the different types that are launched. Uh, there's the, 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 the you know, pretty much the predominant type is the Visala RS-41, uh, which takes up 30% of the world's market share. Uh, and then there's a number of other types as well. So I'm going to go through a couple of these now and apologies to the people listening on the repeater. I don't have slides for this part. Um, so I have a selection of different types of radio songs here. First up, going from well, biggest to smallest in some respects. This is a Lockheed Martin uh, LMS-6 radio sonde. And it is probably the biggest, well, neglecting the ozone sonde, which is down there. This is probably the biggest radio sonde on the market at the moment. It's also ancient. These, these were designed in about 2005 and they're still flying them. Um, they're heavy. This one actually runs on L-band on 1.6 gigahertz as well. So I was sent this to be able to add support for this particular radio sonde type to my software. Uh, the French did their own thing and made their own uh, Meteo Modem M10. Um, you'll notice there's a trend here. They're all white boxes made out of foam. Um, and it does the same thing. There's a temperature sensor and humidity sensor and a GPS inside of it and an antenna. Uh, the Germans did their own as well. This is the DFM 09. Uh, again, same thing. Radio, microcontroller, temperature sensor. Humidity sensor, it's all sounding pretty familiar. Um, of interesting note, um, we didn't think these were launched in Australia. Uh, we thought these were a European only thing. As it turns out, there is the Snowy Mountains Hydro uh, scheme actually launched these particular radio songs uh, as part of their cloud seeding program uh, in, the blue, in the Snowy Mountains. So occasionally we see one of these things appear on the tracking network. Uh, the South Africans, 
built their own as well. This is an internet I met for. And while most of these radio songs that I've got here transmit frequency shift keying, FSK, this one transmits AFSK at 1200 board. That might sound familiar to you. It's exactly the same as APRS. Uh, not the same format exactly, but it's very, very similar. Um, the reason they do that is because the ground stations for these particular radio songs is an ICOM ICR10, which is a big brother or the newer version of this scanner that I've got here in my hand. Um, so yeah, they, they designed it to be as easy as possible to receive, which is pretty interesting. Now we get to the, uh, the Finnish radio songs, the Vaisalas. Vaisala being the uh, market leader in radio songs at the moment. This is an RS-92. Uh, this is, these are now obsolete, but these were flown for many, many years in Australia. And you may, if you've recovered a radio song in the last 10 years, you've probably seen one of these. It's got a nice big fat helical antenna for GPS on top uh, and the sensor stalk as usual, temperature sensor and humidity sensors and a very large battery in the back. Uh, this radio song is a little bit interesting in that there's a lot of custom silicon inside of this box. Uh, the Vaisala, uh, I don't know why they did it, but they did it and they basically made their own microcontroller and made their own radio transmitter chip. It's all custom silicon. It's, it's incredible. It's also almost impossible to reuse. So anyway. Finally, we end up with the Vaisala RS-41. Uh, this is the, yeah, accounts currently for 30% of worldwide launches. And um, so the Vaisala RS-41 uh, transmits 4800 board frequency shift key, a uh, bit of forward error correction, and it will run, it will transmit, you know, at least in its stock configuration between 400 and 406 megahertz. Uh, it will, the radio chip inside of it will go a lot further than that. Um, being the most common radio sonde out there, it has had the most amount of reverse engineering applied to it. Uh, thankfully, unlike the RS-92, it is nothing, you know, it's all commodity components. Uh, so I'll get into that a little bit more. So what's inside one of these RS-41s? Well, first up, we have a STM32 microcontroller, an ARM uh, Cortex-M0 microcontroller, easy to reflash. We have a U-Blox chipset, a GPS chipset, Again, very, very common GPS chipset, very high performing chipset. Also very obsolete, this particular version. Um, I don't quite know what Vaisala's plans are in this situation. I'm hoping there'll be a board refresh with a more modern GPS, but we'll see. Um, there is a radio chip, which is a Silicon Laboratories SI4032. This particular radio chip will tune anywhere between about 300 megahertz and about one gigahertz, which is pretty cool. Uh, though the matching network on between it and the antenna is only good up to about you know 450 megahertz or so, but we can tune it to the amateur radio band, and it will produce about 50 milliwatts of transmit power. The silver stalk that you see is where all of Vaisala's secret source lives. These, this is their um, temperature and humidity sensor. The temperature sensor is good from about plus 60 degrees to negative 90 degrees Celsius. It's a platinum wire. It's a resistive sensor. And then there's a, then there's a capacitive uh, humidity sensor as well. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really know how to reuse any of these at the moment. Uh, Vaisala have gone and implemented their own analog to digital converter on the PCB. And I think there's a couple of schematics out there for it now, but I don't think anyone's written code to um, communicate with those sensors. It'd be really cool if someone did, because um, then you have some very nice high performing temperature and humidity sensors to play with. Last but not least, we have an expansion header. Uh, so this is where we would connect to things like um, other sensors. So for example, this box here is an ozone sonde. Now these are launched in Australia from three places, Melbourne, Macquarie Island and Davis Station. And they're huge, it's mostly foam. And inside of it is a, is a, it's a, some kind of electrochemical cell which can measure ozone. And it plugs into the RS-41 via a little connector at the base of the RS-41. Uh, now, the title of this talk was Chasing Songs for Fun and No Profit. You get 50 bucks for these if you return them. It doesn't quite cover your fuel. So again, no profit, still holds true. 
Uh, there's also on the RS41, there's a little coil on the right hand side of the PCB. This is VK5 Quebec India identifying on VK5 RLZ. Uh, and that coil is used to configure the radio sonde before it's launched. Uh, they don't plug into the connector, they just sit it on a little holder and it configures the sonde, sets the frequency, applies some calibration parameters, and then they take it outside and launch it. So Handily, that connector at the bottom of the radio sonde also breaks out programming wires for the microcontroller. Makes it very, very easy for us to reflash them. So I've made up this little adapter here going into an STM or ST Link programming board. I can plug that into the base of the radio sonde and reprogram it with my own firmware. It's a number of firmwares available on GitHub, it's all open source. Uh, so on the slide, there's a couple of examples there. For example, RS41 Fox uh, turns an RS41 into a fox hunting beacon. Uh, so you can make it, you know, here's an RS41 that I've painted black. It's got a magnet in the back of it. I can stick it to metal objects and it will beacon away for quite some time um, because there's a GPS on board. When the battery gets flat, it'll start beaconing out where it is so someone can go and find it. Uh, the other firmware, which I've linked there, the RS41 HUP or my specific uh, fork of it, is what we use on all of our Project Chorus Hydro Tube balloon flights. So um, I launch balloons with, high, with Project Chorus. Uh, and yeah, so we actually use RS41s, uh, reprogram ones as our primary telemetry. Now that's a topic for an entirely separate talk. I'm not gonna cover it in detail tonight. So how do we go about decoding these? Well, all of the radio tones that I've shown so far uh, can be decoded by multiple software packages th that are available. In most cases, all you need is an FM receiver of some description, like a scanner, for example, this ICOM ICR10 here. But in many cases, particularly for the radio songs that use um, higher board rates, you need something like a discriminator tap. So to, to get unfiltered audio, a standard FM filtered receiver won't work. It's often easier to use software defined radio to do this. Uh, so using software like SDR Sharp or GTRX, whatever you want to use, there's plenty of options out there. To actually decode telemetry, there's a few options. Uh, Son Monitor is venerable. It's been around for at least 12 years, if not more. Um, it costs about 50 bucks and it decodes all sorts of different radio son types. Uh, the developer, uh, Bev, is a really nice guy. And he actually holidays here in South Australia in the Barossa Valley. Um, so he's here every year. Uh, RS41 Tracker is relatively newer. Uh, and that is specific for RS41s. It, it works pretty well. It's got a map. It's quite kind of cool. Um, it's, it's free. Uh, it is closed source. You can't go modify it. Uh, there's also this bit of software called DXL APRS, which tracks a few different radio song types. It's designed to run on Raspberry Pis as well. Um, its code base is best described as opaque. It's a little bit hard to work with if you want to modify it. So uh, back when I started this particular hobby, uh, I decided I'd go and write my own. So we come to Radius on Auto RX. So the main reason this was written uh, was because back when I started, they were launching RS-92s, these songs here, and the frequency would change from launch to launch. Nowadays, that is running on the same frequency all the time. Uh, but back then, it would change. Every single launch would be on a different frequency. It was getting very difficult to try and track and decode them. Uh, so I wanted a way that I could scan the, you know, the radio sonde frequency range uh, and find and decode them automatically. Uh, so I based this around a set of um, open source decoders written by a guy on GitHub called RS1729. And I wrote some Python code to automatically scan um, for the sons to decode them and upload the telemetry to the internet. Um, so the moment uh, we support a pretty big range of radio song types. So everything that you saw before, that I showed before, we support those radio songs. Um, we've switched in the last year to a very, very high performing uh, frequency shift king decoder written by David Rowe. You may have heard of VK5 DGR. He's, he wrote Codec 2 uh, and FreeDV. He's, he's a local DSP guru. We're actually working on some improvements right now to this code. Uh, so. This means that we know the software side of the modem is performing as well as it possibly can be. Uh, the RF side is up to you, however. Uh, at the bottom of the um, slide there is a link to the software, and I'll cover a bit more about how to set it up a little bit later on. So when I present, presented upon this at the beginning of uh, 
probably about 2019, there were about 60 stations using this software. As of today, there's 172 users worldwide, which kind of freaks me out slightly. Um, and since we started logging unique telemetry, we've actually decoded, we being the AutoRx decoding network, has decoded 63,000 unique radio songs. So we're totally meeting the um, project aim of tracking all the radio songs, or at least we're getting a long way towards it. So how do we get started? Well, um, AutoRx is designed to run on a Raspberry Pi and work with a RTL software defined radio. It's quite possible you have everything you need to do this in your shack already. So again, you need some kind of Linux machine. So Raspberry Pi, is a pretty good candidate for that. You could run it on something else if you wanted to. You need a software defined radio, an RTL SDR in particular, and a antenna of some description. We're all hams, we've probably got a 70 centimeter antenna lying around the place. They work pretty well. Um, as for the RTL SDR, I recommend the RTL SDR blog, the three SDRs, they're very good. Though Newelec also do a pretty good version, and there's other ones out there as well. The key point is that it should have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. Uh, frequency stability is very important in decoding these radio sounds. A preamplifier is not mandatory. Um, you can receive surprisingly well without one, uh, but if you're trying to track radio sounds that might be a long way away from you, then it will help. Um, there's a mob called Uputronics. Uh, thanks for the, um, yep, so Paul's holding up an RTL SDR. Um, the Uputronics uh, sell a very nice preamplifier that has bandpass filtering as well, specifically for the radio song band. They work extremely well. Um, as mentioned before, all the software is open source, available on GitHub, and there's a link on the slide on how to get started with the software. So, Here's a bit of a flowchart showing how AutoRx operates. On the left, we have our RF hardware, which captures the radio signal and converts it into digital samples, which we can then do signal processing on. The first thing AutoRx does is it does a, a scan over the radio sound band. It basically takes a big uh, fast Fourier transform, a spectrum, uh, and looks for signals that are above a certain signal to noise ratio, ratio threshold. Now for each of those, um, uh, peaks that it finds, it looks at each of them in turn and tries to work out whether the signal is a radio sond or not. And you might wonder how on earth we do this. Well, every radio sond transmission is unique in some way. They have a particular kind of transmit header. Uh, every sond has a different one. Uh, and we can correlate um, the received signal against a known set of headers. And we can determine with very good reliability what whether we're listening to is a radio sound and what type of radio sound it is. Uh, once we know what type of radio sound it is, we can start decoding it um, and then upload telemetry, telemetry. So telemetry can be uploaded to APRS IS, the APRS internet service. You can see it on things like APRS.fi. We also have HabHub, uh, the higher tube balloon tracking website. Now we have um, Sond Hub, which is a proxy uh, in front of that website which does filtering, uh, filters out just radio songs. That's developed by Michael Wheeler, uh, VK3FUR. Uh, and we can also send out telemetry to local mapping services like Chase Mapper, which is a browser-based mapping service, which I'll cover in a bit of detail shortly. Now the AutoRx um, software also provides you with a web interface so you can see what's going on. So, Here's an example showing uh, the scan results of the spectrum display showing a pretty strong signal right in the center there. This is our detected radio sound. Uh, above it, if I scroll up a little bit, we see telemetry data coming from a radio sound. Now I'd show this live, but the radio sound hasn't launched yet. We won't have launched for about, for another probably half an hour or so. Um, so on the slide there, you can see the telemetry data from the radio sound showing where it is, temperature, humidity, uh, the range to the radio sound, and also the SNR, signal to noise ratio of the signal. And in the center of the screen, we see a map showing where the radio sound is and where you are. So this is good for just the local display. What is your station doing? But the real power comes when you upload the data to SondHub or HabHub and see, uh, and see it all on a map. So this is tracker.sondhub.org. Now I'm just going to Drop my, drop my screen share momentarily. Actually, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna un full screen this. 
and show you Sondhub live. Sorry to the people that are on the radio. Um, you have to look at the slide. So this is Sondhub. And there are currently quite a few radio sons in the air at the moment. And if I just zoom out and show the entire world, come on. Well, this is Europe anyway, that will do. It's a little bit slow at the moment. And we can see radio sons all over the place. Uh, not all stations launch at those defined times, 0, 12, etc. Some of them launch in between. Uh, on the map, we can see little antenna icons. These are all receiving stations. Not all of them are, radi are radio sun receivers, but many of them are. Um, and if we go to Australia, you will see there's more than likely no songs in the air. Actually, if we look at Melbourne, what we're actually seeing there is the ozone sonde. So today, uh, Wednesday, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology launched an ozone sonde from Broadmeadows in Melbourne. This was the, um, the radio sonde track from Melbourne. And we can look at telemetry um, as it's coming in. We can get, get a plot at the bottom showing the um, height of the sonde, the various temperatures and things like that. It's all pretty cool. And you can also see who's receiving the signals as well. There's a little green line that shows up going to the receiving stations. Let's bring up the slides again. So Chase Mapper. So Sond Hub is all good, is pretty good when you've got access to the internet. If you want, if you want to go out and chase a radio sond yourself, you might not have net connectivity. So what do we do at that point? Well, we solved this problem many years ago. So Project Horus has been launching since 2010. And when we started, we developed a system called um, Aussie Explorer. And this allowed us, this was based, sorry, Aussie Plotter, sorry, um, which was based around a mapping software called Aussie Explorer, Windows only, used, topograph used topographical maps, it was pretty good. And we had a completely offline mapping system. It worked really well. If we had no phone coverage, we still had maps, we would get telemetry, plot up on the map, off we go. Um, it being Windows only somewhat annoyed me um, for a while. Plus Aussie Explorer was a very old bit of software, even when we started. Um, so after doing the Auto RX mapping display, I decided I'll have a crack at writing my own. Uh, and that became Chase Mapper. So I wrote this in Python. I'm using various technologies called Flask uh, and Leaflet for mapping. Uh, and it interfaces with um, Auto RX to show the sun position on the map. It'll also show positions of other balloon flights, for example, Project Horus launches. Things like that can also be fed into Chase Mapper. Um, you can download weather models. So one thing I didn't quite cover was that you know all this data these radio sons collect feeds into global weather models. The probably one of the biggest ones is called the Global Forecast System. We can download that data or portions of it in the case of what we're doing here, and use it to predict where a balloon is going to travel. So in the case of on this slide, we can see where the radio sonde is, and we can see. Um, a blue path heading in front of the sonde, showing where the sonde is going to travel, or at least where it's predicted to travel. And it's usually pretty good. Um, the idea here will be you'll just drive to where the predicted landing site is. And usually it works pretty well. If you get really good at it, you can watch the radio sonde land. Paul's done that a few times. I've done it quite a few times as well. It's really good fun. Um, another nice feature, which was added in about a year ago, was you can share where you are with other users of Chase Mapper and also with the online map. So in this case, a challenger appears um, on the bottom of the map there. So I can see when someone else is out chasing as well. And spectators who might be watching tracker.sondhub at home can see where those people that are out chasing are. It turns radio sond hunting into a spectator sport. It's good fun. Um, and because it got very popular, we had to, we, we got to the point where there were so many radios on chases in Adelaide, we had to, we had to start a mailing list, um, the SON BK5 SON chases mailing list, because otherwise we found SONs were going missing. Still happens a couple, still happens occasionally, but it's pretty good nowadays. So this is an example of Chase Mapper uh, being displayed on um, a tablet in my car. So just as a point of note, Chase Mapper actually runs on the same Raspberry Pi um, as AutoRx, or it's designed to anyway, and you access it via a web browser, on a tablet, on your phone, on a laptop, doesn't matter. 
Um, in this case, I use an iPad mini on the dashboard of my car, and I just have this running throughout the chase. I can see where the song's going, where I should be driving to. Of course, I'm looking at the road, not at my iPad while I'm driving. So how do you do your first radio song chase? Well, first up, you want to make sure that the radio song launch is actually going to be recoverable in the first place. And we can use those weather models to do predictions to find that out. Um, there's a website, predict.habhub.org, which lets you just generically specify a launch location uh, and run predictions. For Australia, um, I've got my own website. And if I just go to that, and again, apologies to the people on the radio, um, I have the, oops, I'll go to the main website first. So rfhead.net forward slash songs. And this has a list of launch sites, which, I, which I'm currently running predictions for, a couple in SA, a couple in Victoria, and also Williamstown in New South Wales. And you can choose the launch site and you can see uh, predictions for the following week. So in this case, uh, the launch tonight, launching in all of 15 minutes, is heading out almost to the border uh, near Karunda, and that is zoomed out way too far. Here we go. Uh, and the green line shows where the landing site is moving over the next few days. And from this, I would say that for the next couple of days, I'm not going to bother going radio sign chasing. That's far too long a drive for my liking. Um, so yeah, you can figure out whether it's worth going and hunting for a radio sign. So what do we, what do, we do next? Well, you can just use the online mapping system and hope that someone receives the radio sign down the ground and you can go and grab it. But you're probably better off running Auto RX on a laptop or on a Raspberry Pi in your car. It would help to have some kind of internet connectivity to do so. Uh, you can look online to look at the live predictions while you're out driving if you've got a phone, if you have phone coverage or net connectivity, or if you think you might not have a reliable internet connection or you might be going somewhere where you're not going to have phone coverage, then you could run Chase Mapper and look at the predictions offline in your car. Well, once the balloon's up, you drive out the landing zone, you drive around for a while, you follow the predicted landing location, and with any luck, the radio sun will be landing or lands in the middle, in the middle, middle of a paddock um, or in the middle of a road or hopefully not on someone's roof, but it does happen, and you can go and recover it after talking to the landowner, of course, um, to get permission. Once you've recovered it, you post on Facebook, you post on Twitter, you post on the mailing list to say, I've recovered the radio sound, all is good. You can now go home and reuse the radio sound for whatever you want. Um, so yeah, there's an email list for VK5. Uh, so VK5 Sound Chasers. There's also a VK Radio Sound Chasers Facebook group, uh, which is worth posting on. Um, so yeah, definitely use these systems to let other people know, know if you're out balloon chasing. How do, we, how do we step things up from here? This is VK5, Quebec, India. Well, this is the back of my car. Uh, so I have a Raspberry Pi mounted permanently in the back of my car. Um, I've got a 3G, oh sorry, a 4G modem with an external antenna to get better internet coverage uh, when I'm out and about. I've got a couple of different antennas which I use for doing radio on chasing. Now, those antennas were designed for Project Horus balloon flights but they work pretty well for songs. Um, normally, I'll use a vertical antenna. This works well when the radio sound is low to the horizon. Uh, I also have a turnstile, which is, which is designed to look upwards. So when the radio sound is directly above your car, um, often the vertical antenna won't work so well. You'll be in a null of the antenna pattern of the sound, and the sound will be in the, in the null of your antenna pattern as well. The turnstile works brilliantly in that particular situation. After you get good at this and do a couple of radio songs, um, radio song chases, eventually you end up seeing them land. And I know Paul's done this a few times. He's had the chance to see a couple of radio songs land. It's pretty cool. You know, it's even better if, you've, if you um, watch it launch at the airport and then drive to the landing site and watch it land. That's, that's very, very, very cool. And then of course, finally, once you've got a stack of these things, you can start reusing them. Uh, you could even do your own balloon launches. Uh, so these RS41 radio songs are excellent um, for balloon tracking. They're lightweight, a couple of AA batteries, works really well. So that's pretty much all I have. 
So I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, if you could type in the chat window um, or raise your hand, and um, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Or on the repeater for those that are sitting on the repeater as well. VK5ZD. VK5ZD. How are you going in? VK5QI. Okay, I don't know whether it's easier to hear me via this repeater instead of the laptop. I'm getting feedback. Hang on. All right, just go ahead, Ian. Okay, quick question. You talked about the need for um, stability frequency wise in the, the SDR receiver. Your software is smart enough to go and find the song. Can it not just track it as well if it's crisp? Okay, so Ian's question there was regarding frequency stability and the point of if I can find the sonde, can't I just track it as well? And the answer is yes, actually, it works just fine. Um, if you're using the, well, the more recent versions of the software, we'll quite happily track um, radio sondes as they drift around. Um, it is nice to have a receiver which is roughly on frequency. The reason being is the receive frequency is actually reported up to the website as well. Uh, and um, it, it, it's nice for other people to see a frequency which actually makes sense and isn't like 20 kilohertz of frequency. So does that answer your question there, Ian? Thank you. No worries. Has anyone else got any other questions for me? Nope, nothing else. Well, um, thank you for listening. Um, it ran a bit shorter than I expected, but that, that's pretty good. Um, I guess I'll hand it back to, to Paul to wrap up, unless anyone else has other questions. So, Paul, you're currently unmuted. Um, yeah, back to you. Okay, I've got a few questions before right. you uh, go. What's the closest you've ever managed to get to one coming down? I've been within 50 metres. It's about as close as I've ever got. About that far. Yeah, you didn't catch it, though. <laughs> Didn't catch it. <laughs> landed directly in front of me. Um, landed directly in front of my car, I should say. Uh, I really wish I had my dash cam. Um, oh, sorry, I should get back on the repeater there as well. Paul asked, um, how close have I been to one coming down? The answer was one landing directly in front of my car. Um, and I, it basically made me go buy a dash cam because if I had a dash cam, I would have caught it on video. Yeah, and I take it you've got a few on video coming down. I've tried, but I've never had much success. Uh, so Paul asked, have I got any on video? Uh, not many actually. Um, often they're too far away and I might have video, but the video is terrible quality. So it really hasn't been worth putting the video anywhere. And another question, uh, are there any uh, binaries for converting one of these to uh, an APRS uh, transmitter? back to stop the screen sharing. Um, so in terms of firmware, uh, there is firmware to do APRS only on the 70 centimeter band though. Um, whereas at least the radio chip only goes to the 70 centimeter band. Um, so yeah, you could do APRS off of them if there was an APRS network for that frequency. Don't forget that they only put out about 50 milliwatts. Um, when you use APRS, which is AFSK, you're throwing away approximately 8 dB of power um, from the double modulations, the FSK on FM. It's not very efficient as it is, and we have to throw quite a few watts of power at it on two meters for it to work reliably. Um, on 70 centimeters, that's the case even more. Um, so yes, you can totally do it. There's firmware out there to do it. I wouldn't really recommend it. There's better options out there. Okay, that answers that one. We were thinking of a club project using them, but it's probably not going to be that practical unless we just use it for walking groups or something like that. So I think what you're talking about, so this is something that Tim was working on and Tim can pipe up here. I'm just going to, oh, let me just get the chat window. Sorry there, Hayden. I'll get to that question in just a second. Um, so I know what Tim was doing was actually taking the audio out of the... Um, the transmitter and using that on a different transmitter. So for example, generating the audio on the RS41 and then feeding a two meter transmitter. Now that would be totally possible to do. 
um, that's a different option. Uh, so um, I've got a couple questions from online. Can you get raw data from a Radioson in real time in a readable format such as CSV? Uh, yes, you totally can. So AutoRx will uh, dump data to disk in real time in CSV. You can also get all the telemetry live um, via uh, a couple of interfaces that I've written, one of them which is used to, to, to do the mapping, but you can also get humidity and temperature at the same time. Um, uh, after the sonde has done its flight, there's a script which you can run, which will uh, do the um, uh, produce a, a stove diagram and off you go. If you want to get data from other launch sites, uh, email me, vk5qi at rfhead.net. We have an interface which is designed specifically to give you all this telemetry of every single launch site all, all at once, essentially, um, all live. So if you want to start doing some real data processing with the data, it's totally there to do that. Um, so hopefully that answers the question there. Um, from um, in Glenn's vk5hz, hello. <laughs> you. I just want to say thank you, by the way, to VK5HZ. Um, he ran an auto RX station at Davis, Davis, Basin in, at Davis Station in Antarctica for like six months. It was a really, excuse the pun, it was a really, really cool to watch balloon launches from the Davis Station. Um, he also had the shortest radio sonde chase of all, where they launched the radio sonde from Davis Station. It broke off the string and landed within the Davis Station compound. And he went and recovered it afterwards. So that, was, that was pretty cool. Um, do I, the question was, do I have good success with landowners? And the answer is yes, landowners, most people that own a large property have seen a radio sonde before. Um, you know, these have been launching for years, you know, many, many years, probably at least 50, I would say. Uh, and most have found one on their property. So they know about them, they know what to look for. They know that it's not good if they get caught up in harvesting equipment. So they're more than happy to have someone uh, go out there and recover this and have it not be an issue for them. Uh, so yeah, it totally not a problem at all. Um, question from Ziggy Walter. Hello Ziggy, how are you going? Uh, and uh, that's, are there any specific additions or new features you have in mind for Auto RX? Uh, more SON types, I would hope. Um, there's always been this particular feature which has been on the back burner forever, which is trying to decode more than one radio sonde at a time with the RTL-SDR, it's totally possible to do it. It's just a lot of effort uh, to um, make it happen, sadly. There's a lot of signal processing work required. Uh, it'll happen eventually, uh, but I'll definitely need help. Um, so anyway, that's the questions from online. Are there any other questions for me? Would you like to talk about Port Wakefield sondes and the fact how you can get out there and have a good chase for half a dozen at a time. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Paul comments on the Port Wakefield son situation. Uh, so there's an interesting story here. About a year ago, a year ago? Must be about a year ago now. Yeah, well, yeah, it was a year ago. I was in, I was on Horn Island when this all occurred. Um, we started getting these reports in Adelaide of people saying, my receiving station is locked onto a radio sonde, but I'm getting no data through. And it was really weird. We couldn't figure out what was going on. This, this was also occurring right around the time that we had a GPS week number rollover. So again, different sidetrack, but um, GPS uses a week number and a time of week to re represent time. Week number is a 10-bit value. It reaches 1,024, then it rolls back to zero. That occurred March or was it maybe April last year. When that occurred, Lots of radio sonde launch sites, including every single Vaisala launch site, broke, completely broke. Um, they just didn't work at all. They had to get a firmware update. It was about a week before the sonde station started launching again. During this time, we noticed that these sondes were showing up, which we couldn't decode. And we're thinking, is this something to do with the weak rollover bug? And the answer was, no, it wasn't. A bit of investigation, and I'm, I'm sitting on Horn Island, all this is occurring. I'm sitting at a hotel on Horn Island in the middle of the Torres Strait, playing with raw binary data. And I'm going, something doesn't make sense here. Turns out that what we were receiving was encrypted radio sons. Now there is a version of the RS-41, which is a military version, the RS-41M, which, which by default is encrypted. 
and we couldn't decode it, and obviously. And we're thinking, where on earth are these things launched from? And a bit of radio direction finding later, we figure out they're launching from Port Wakefield. Now, those that don't know, Port Wakefield proof range is a, um, they do firing trials up there, all sorts of interesting things. If they're doing a firing trial, they want to know what the wind conditions are. So they launch radio sons. Here we go, Paul's got a RS-41 SGM on the screen. Not sure whether I can highlight Paul's video. Let me just do that. Spotlight Paul, there you go. Um, and there's an RS-41 SGM. That's actually the old version, I believe. Um, so anyway, um, we had a discussion with some people. Uh, we, I managed to get a contact out at the Port Wakefield proof range and they were kind enough to turn off the encryption, which was pretty awesome of them. What this meant was that we could now decode them. Um, and when they do a firing trial, they launch a radio sonde on the hour, every hour, from about eight in the morning till about 3 p.m. That's a lot of radio sondes per day. Uh, so a few of us took the opportunity and spent, took a day off work and spent a whole day recovering radio sondes. Good fun. Uh, myself and Liam Gunning managed to get every sond launch from one of the days. Um, pretty cool. Um, and yes, I went out once know. and only got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul says he only went out, went out and only got one of them. Uh, sorry, Paul. Um, so I've got a whole stack of these things up on a shelf up here. Um, again, I just use them like regular radio songs. Uh, we're not going to see that happen again, unfortunately. It's very unlikely. Uh, that was for a particular trial. Um, that trial has now occurred up at Woomera. When the trial was occurring, uh, many of the radio son receiving sites in Adelaide we could actually see the songs from Woomera. And we would see, you know, uh, seven in a day showing up up at, Woomera, up at Woomera. I don't know what they're doing. I don't want to know. But as a result, we got a whole bunch of radio songs to play with. It was awesome. So, yeah, thanks for that one, Paul. No more Any other questions? questions? Any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, any questions from the people on VK5RLZ? This is VK5QI. Uh, no, nothing. No, nothing heard. I just want to say thank you, Mark. That was excellent. And uh, a round of applause from everyone, please. No worries. Yep. Thanks, everyone. And um, hope to be back and talk about something else in the future. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Excellent. Mark. That was, uh, very, very good. Right, so just, just unmuted everyone. And um, yeah, thanks all. Uh, thanks to Hayden for streaming this as well on YouTube. Hello yep. to everyone on YouTube as well. Yeah. And um, I'll catch you next time. It's my yeah, first time on Zoom. <laughs> Not a problem. Good. All right, thanks everyone. I'm going to close the meeting and um, I'll catch you whenever I catch you next. Probably Friday night.